right. The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. and You do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and eye salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, I may also, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, we plead with you this evening to anoint us in our weakness and frailty with both the needed hearing and speaking of your holy word. We ask you for hearts that are granted the grace of conviction, of sin and of righteousness, of judgment and of the love of God that passes all understanding. We ask you to glorify yourself in what we consider and to employ these texts to our growth in grace. And if we are unsaved or if we are lukewarm to our salvation or restoration, We plead this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please be seated? Brothers and sisters in Christ, this evening we are coming to one of the most serious accusations in Scripture from the mouth of God himself. This is a passage of the utmost solemnity passage toward the end of the Bible that should be something that every one of us from time to time considers humbly with contrite heart and the prayer for <coughs> excuse me eyes to see and ears to hear. Consider some of the evidences of its seriousness. If you look carefully at what he says, I would that you were hot or cold, he is saying, Jesus is saying, that he would rather have us hostile to him than to be lukewarm. Lukewarm is a condition in which you're sort of hot and sort of cold. And it's a condition that could be described as double-mindedness, ambivalence, indifference, or falling away. I think that two other passages of equivalent seriousness are in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 that speak of tasting of the word of God, experiencing some of the blessings of the gospel and of the grace of God, and yet crucifying afresh the Son of Grace. And so, beloved, I've asked God to grant me the grace to somehow convey that which is beyond my ability in the flesh, that every one of us from time to time needs to consider this text. We live in a hostile world. Our hearts can become dull incrementally. It's easy to be 
legitimately concerned with so many things that gradually our walk with Christ, our abiding with him gets cold and then lukewarm. So it's a condition that calls, the text is, is a warning that calls us to self-examination. And it's a condition that we are very foolish. Listen to this. We are very foolish if we think it cannot happen to us. That's how serious it is. To be vomited out of the mouth of Christ is to be rejected by him as utterly repulsive, sickening. To be despised by him. And it's a condition that can creep up upon us unwittingly. It's serious because it always includes self-deception. Look at verses 17 and 18. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined from fire that you may become rich, white garments that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness may be not be revealed, and I salve to submit your to anoint your eyes that you may see. Jesus Christ is saying we can bl be blind to our nakedness. We can be indifferent to our shame. We can be spiritually poverty stricken, well, poverty stricken while we think we're rich. We have the capacity to believe we have not, that we need nothing when we need everything. And I would remind you that Jesus Christ declared it was easier for a rich man, it's more difficult for a rich man to get through into heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Material wealth has a remarkable capacity to dull our awareness of our dependency. And one of the things we considered, albeit briefly this morning, Jesus Christ's declaration that without me you can do nothing, speaking to all of us. And so, beloved, it's a condition that is clarified by Christ in such a way that with prayer it can be recognized. It not only includes self-deception as to our true estate, but it also is a condition that Jesus Christ himself clearly warns against at the beginning of his public ministry. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. He who is not with me is against me. Let me read that again. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. There's a sense in which lukewarmness is a fiction in the mind in this, this sense that we think it's a condition that is livable, withable, if I could put it that way, that lukewarmness, after all, is not that bad. It's easily recovered from. But when you consider that Christ regards it as more dangerous than open hostility, I think that's serious. I hope you do too. It's a con condition that Christ says if we recover from it, we will be placed under severe discipline. Verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, context matters. He's, of course, including the exhortation to repent of any known sin, but especially and particularly the inclination to be lukewarm. It's a danger that is well attested to in Scripture from centuries before Christ himself uttered these words. Proverbs 14, 6, There's a way that seems right unto a man, and thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 28, 
26, he who trusts his own heart is a fool. And one of the best evidences of a careful walk with Christ is a conscious and conspicuous attestation of one's own self-deception potential. And then the passage that we read in Zephaniah, that God, let me get the exact wording here, I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit. Something stagnant, when water's stagnant, it's not moving. It's just sitting. It's going nowhere. And I think it's fairly easy to demonstrate that in life there is nothing that's static. Everything has dynamic movement. We're either growing or decaying. We're either declining or increasing. And in the physical world, we know that that's true. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that there's entropy, that there's a gradual loss of energy. And so there's many reasons, we'll consider some of those shortly, uh, why people end up moving toward lukewarmness. But it's serious enough that Jesus Christ calls us to be open to correction. Behold, I reprove and discipline those whom I love. That's an expression of love that we probably don't love. But it's an expression of the tender concern of Jesus Christ for the sake of our souls. It's possible to so emphasize the love of God that we forget to emphasize the discipline and rebuke of God. And that if indeed we are his, from time to time, God is going to rebuke us, correct us, admonish us, and discipline us. It's a condition that can be resolved only with the receiving of discipline and the responding to Christ's counseling, which is what he's doing here. And I remind you that in Isaiah where the Christ is spoken of as Wonderful Counselor, Eternal Father, and other titles, that there are all two-word titles. And the first two, Wonderful, comma, Counselor, is not biblical. It's Wonderful Counselor. And here we see an example of Christ doing some wonderful counseling. It's a serious charge that Christ levels here to those who are lukewarm because it hinders the ability to clearly commit to confessing him. Matthew 10. Early in his public ministry, Jesus Christ had this to say about commitment. Verse 32, Everyone therefore who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father, who is in heaven. Whoever shall deny me before men, then I also will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. We can deny Jesus Christ by passivity. He who is not with me is against me. By simply lukewarm, nominal behave, believing, nominal living of the Christian life, mechanically, uh, is one way to put it. It is possible to deny Christ without realizing one even has done it. And since our hearts have the ability to justify in ourselves what we will condemn in others, we need to be exceedingly careful that we are not, without a being self-aware, denying Jesus Christ. Verse 37 and third to through 39 of the same passage. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. 
Dear ones, we are to be cross bearers. And if there's no willingness to bear the cross that Christ has designed, custom designed for each of us, that's a sign of potential or real lukewarmness. So it's a demonstrated a condition that reveals itself in a number of ways. And this falls under that umbrella of self-examination, which we commit to when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Because if we accept the elements, we're committing to self-examination. And regarding this text with its attendant truths is a great help in examining our hearts, especially concerning the potential to be lukewarm. So what are some of the contributing causes of lukewarmness? Well, we've seen that one is spiritual blindness, the failure to see our true condition. We've already read that from the passage. A failure to humbly and carefully self-examine, and especially in light of the belief of the warning of self-deception potential. Jeremiah 17, 9, our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who's the object of the deception? Moi, ourself. It's we who deceive ourselves. We don't deceive others nearly as well as we deceive ourselves. And we know that this is ultimately a reflection of pride. Pride of the heart leads us to the illusion of self-sufficiency. Christ deals with that in this passage in verse 17 especially because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked I believe that one of the best marks of growing in grace and the grace of Jesus Christ of maturing in the faith is increasing and not decreasing our awareness of our yet remaining sin. The fact that holiness, growing in its perception and maturity, helps us see as sinful things that early in our Christian experience never dawned on us were sinful. And awareness of sins of omission generally does not come quickly after conversion, but slowly grows if we're walking with Christ. I remind you of Christ's answering the disciples' question about the signs of the second coming in Matthew 25. And he points out that on that day he will say to the goats, you didn't feed me when I was hungry, visit me when I was sick and in prison, you didn't clothe me when I was naked, and so on. And Christ, they will say to Christ, when did we not do this? And he will say, when you did not do it to the least of my brethren. And that's going to be a standard of judgment, or particularly sins of omission. So we can be oblivious to sins of omission and think we're doing well when in fact the evidence of a changed heart is declining or is absent. A failure to set our mind in heavenly things. It is possible to confess Jesus Christ and yet be worldly minded. Colossians 3, Paul tells us to set our mind on heavenly things and to focus on Jesus Christ, not the things that are below. And it's easy to get caught up in the world where we're so intensely involved with some things which may in themselves be innocuous that our heart's commitment to Christ dulls just through neglect. I think another contributory cause is our natural tendency to decline or be disinclined to call sin, sin. I think it's so easy 
to call sin mistakes, to call children sinning mischievousness, to redefine sin that began in the Garden of Eden. And it's one of the things we get this, parents, never have to teach our children. They instinctively know how to explain away sin, to blame others, and to redefine it so it's not as bad as it really is. Another contributory cause to lukewarmness can be self-love. And that nobody has to teach us either. We do well at that. Nobody has to instruct us how to love ourselves more. I remember some years ago when our first granddaughter was about two or three watching that uh, incredibly stupid program, at times at least, of the big yellow bird, Sesame Street. And there's this song, I Love You, in it. She, without any instruction from her parents, proceeded to sing the song with all the verses, except she trans transcribed it, if you will, or changed it to, I love me, I love me. Nobody had to teach her to do that. She did that instinctively. And that's a small snapshot of our capacity to put ourselves first, to be selfishly first inclined to have our own needs met, to serve ourselves first. In John, 1 John, that marvelous epistle, the apostle tells us not to love the world. For if we love the world, the love of God is not in us. And it's very possible to grow, to have a love of the world and the things in the world and not even realize it's an idolatrous love. I think it's no mystery and it's not surprising that at the end of that marvelous epistle on the love of God, 1 John, that the last verse is an apparently unusual digression. Little children, keep yourself from idols. And the fact is, every one of us, every day, has the capacity, the potential, to worship an idol in our heart. Invisible, unseen, but still an idol. How do we define an, evil, an, an idol? It's that to which we give our first affections and attention. That's a good way to define an idol. Allowing oneself to ignore the commandment to fight the good fight of faith. Notice the word Christ uses here, verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. The idea of overcoming is often tied with the idea of putting on the whole armor of God. And I would remind you, dear ones, that when we put on the armor of God, we're not to sit back with a glass of mint julep tea and relax. The armor is to be put on for the purpose of fighting the good fight of faith. And if we lose sight of the fact that we are in a conflict, we open ourselves up to lukewarm non nominalism, lukewarm outward show with inward poverty. I think another way of moving unwittingly in the direction of lukewarmness is to be careless in repenting of sin. In our prayers, it's easy to say at the end or somewhere, Lord, forgive us our sins and believe it's covered. Yet in the confession, we who are church officers swear to uphold those truths in the confession and one of them is that we are to confess particular sins particularly or specific sins specifically. We're to name sin and to carefully acknowledge that it's wrong, that it's evil, that it's repulsive to God and to pray for the grace to turn from it with godly sorrow for having offended our Heavenly Father, as well as for having committed the sin itself. 
an unwillingness to open oneself to Christ's fellowship and presence. Look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will dine with him and he with me. This text has been represented as an evangelical text. And I am not saying it can't have an evangelical effect, but it's not primarily a text to unbelievers. This is a letter to a church. This is a letter to a congregation in which Christ is saying, sisters and brothers, you've got a problem there in Laodicea. And it's a problem that can occur in any other church. And in fact, we have the history of the church in the Western world, in Great Britain, and Scotland, and Wales, North Ireland, the United States here, of churches that once were sound, that incrementally in little indiscernible steps gave up the faith, became careless in the doctrines of the faith, and careless in their application. I think that receiving correction humbly without being defensive or taking offense is one of the sweetest evidences of a mature heart. Sloth and laziness can be a cause or a contributory cause of lukewarmness. It's easy to become careless in the use of the means of grace. It's easy to become just unmotivated bit by little bit. And I think another reason that can contribute is a desire for earthly security, forgetting that we are strangers and pilgrims here and that this place is not our home. Forgetting to focus, and I do mean the word focus keenly, as is so beautifully reflected in Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and 3. Forgetting to daily focus on Jesus Christ can be a backdoor way to lukewarmness, which is disgusting to Christ. And something even as simple as sickness or injury Chronic ailments, advancing age, all can become excuses for getting careless with the things of God. So what to do about it? Can this be overcome? Well, verse 21, Christ says, he who overcomes. Lukewarmness is overcomable. But beware lest one thinks it's just a matter of fact of saying a few repentant prayers and uh, thinking a bit differently that could be more self-deception it can be overcome beginning with repentance that is qualified look at verse 19 this is an underlinable verse those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. He be zealous, therefore, and repent. It's interesting that we have examples in the Old Testament and some in the New of heartfelt repentance. David's repentance after being confronted by Nathan the prophet was zealous repentance. I think sometimes we get turned off by the word zealous because it's the same root as zealot. And we know that there are cultic groups that have improper zeal in what they teach. But we are called to be zealous, love and good works, and here zealous in repentance. This is a call to seriously come before Christ I don't recommend that we have dust and ashes, although if you wanted to use it, that certainly wouldn't be unbiblical. But the point is, is to humble ourselves. A uh, good way to do so is with prayer and fasting. 
uh, asking God to grant us the gift and grace of repentance and to using models of repentance that are there in Scripture for our benefit. Let's turn for a moment to Job chapter 46. Try 42. Job 42. Here is a model of repentance. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things that, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that uh, hides counsel without knowledge? He's talking about himself. Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand. He's admitting he spoke knowledgeably when he didn't have the knowledge to speak that way. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I have pridefully sought to declare what I was ignorant of. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask of you, and do you instruct me? I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Now my eye sees you. Therefore I retract, and it has the sense literally of abhorring myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. What an example of contrite repentance that is a repentance that does not need to be repented of. It's no accident that in the New Testament, Paul, inspired by the Spirit, warns us of that potential. It's, we are so equipped, even after we're saved, with a capacity for self-deception that we can de deceive ourselves into thinking we've repented when we have not. We need to admit our spiritual poverty. How did Christ begin if you will, the, the flagstaff, the cornerstone sermon of his public ministry, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, the very first words of that sermon, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That means confessing, acknowledging, recognizing, admitting to God our spiritual poverty. And that's, of course, here in verse 8 and 17 of our text. You think you're rich and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The richer we are in the grace of God, the more clearly we will understand our still remaining spiritual poverty. And then he gives a second call to overcoming. And if you look at verse 7, uh, verse 18, we find that. I advise you, buy from me gold refined in fire, or refined by fire, that you may become rich. Well, what does that mean? To buy from me gold refined by fire. Clearly, it does not mean the metal. It's clearly spiritual gold. And we see a beautiful call centuries before in Isaiah 55, calling us to do the same thing, to buy of God that for which we cannot pay in money. Isaiah 55, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Hear the prophets speaking now for the Lord. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. What does Christ say at the end of his admonition to the Laodicean congregation? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
He's talking about being under the proclamation of the word of God, being under the teaching of the word of God, the instruction of the word of God. He's talking about the immeasurable wealth of the truths of scripture, which are bought by coming into his presence with a teachable heart and a listening ear. I think it's interesting that often the eye gate is represented as the gate through which much failure to live in a holy way comes, indeed much sin. Bunyan reflects this well in his great work, The Holy War. And the eye gate, Christ tells us, is the gate through which we can lust and have a desire for that which is not proper. Uh, he that looks after a woman to lust after in his heart committed adultery already. That's an example of eye gate sinning. And what's the opposite gate for blessing? It's the ear gate. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's ear gate recovery. That's ear gate truth. That's ear gate gold, the gold of Scripture. In Proverbs, Solomon tells us that he who turns away his ear from hearing the word, even his prayer becomes an abomination. He who turns away his ear from hearing the law, his prayer becomes a stench in the nostrils of God. Incredible. And so we're being called to embrace the means of grace which center around the God-ordained mystery of preaching. With all our world of texting and tweeting and stuff I don't understand in the way of electronic communication, as we're losing literally the ability to communicate in person in a group of people or one-on-one, -on -one, God has still preserved as the premier means he has ordained the proclamation of the word to convert sinners and build up saints in the most holy faith. And so we buy the gold that is refined by fire. It's the tested word of God that has never failed. Every word has been preserved. And that's the spiritual riches Christ calls us to, to overcome lukewarmness. And we're to buy garments to cover our nakedness. I believe Paul has summed it up most beautifully in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He that is God the Father hath made him, that is Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You and I, if we believe in Christ savingly, are covered by his righteousness. His blood was necessary to wash away our sin. His righteousness was necessary to enable us to stand in the presence of God without being covered with shame because spiritually we're naked. We have nothing to offer of our own. And so Jesus Christ, through God the Father's actual transferring the righteousness of Christ to us and transferring our sin to Christ to pay the price of that sin covers our nakedness as well as washing away the guilt and the condemnation of our sin. And then he says that we are to put eye salve or buy eye salve to anoint our eyes. Well, how do we do that? Buy eye salve to anoint our eyes. Let's go for a minute to John chapter 9. A passage that I trust is familiar and please God, blessed in your thinking. Gospel of John, chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. 
We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spit on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes, to the blind man's eyes, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And he, and he went away and washed and came back seeing. What should we extract from that? To anoint our eyes with eye salve. Here Jesus Christ anointed the blind man with the eye salve of the clay that he made with his own spittle and put it on his eyes. It's the acceptance through faith of the redeeming ministry of Christ as the light of the world. Remember in the opening sermon, he says, in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. That light comes reflected as the moon reflects the light of the sun. That if we are walking in Christ, if we're abiding in Christ, if he is dwelling in us and we are dwelling in him, there is a light that comes from that that enables one to see spiritual reality and to see through the haze of our yet remaining weakness, knowing that we need help to see. Buying ISAV is acknowledging to Christ that apart from his perfect pastoral ministry, we cannot see what we need to see. And then, we are to accept Christ's loving reproof. Now, I've said earlier that I believe one of the best evidences of a quickened heart is the ability to accept correction without being defensive, without taking offense, without being wounded, but rather accepting it thankfully as an evidence of Christ's shepherding, sanctifying, love. I can't emphasize that too strongly. And if you listen carefully to interactions amongst Christians, you will find that few admonitions are tendered and even fewer are received without being defensive or trying to explain them away. And so here Jesus Christ is telling us that we are to receive these kinds of admonitions and reproof. Now this is so important a point that I'm going to ask you to turn to several other texts. Hebrews 10, beginning with verse 19. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Christ, it's because our sins are washed away in the guilt and pollution of them, and the condemnation of them. He says, since we're given confidence to enter the holy place that way by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, now comes the application. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good works. Let me read that again. Let us consider, let us ponder how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing nigh. We are to embrace the means of grace that God has given in fellowship, and of course, especially and particularly on the Lord's Day, in which we interact with each other in a stimulating, 
encouraging, nudging fashion. And let me ask you, when is the last time you have received an admonition from a brother or sister and received it thankfully? When is the last time you have carefully and humbly confronted a brother or sister with an observed problem? Luke 17, hear the commandment. Verses 3 and 4. Verse 3, be on your guard. Means be alert. That's a term that's given in the military often. Be on your guard. Why? In what respect? If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. I believe that one reason the visible church, and I'm talking about now the believing segment, not the apostate liberal church, but those congregations and denominations, few in number, that are faithful to the word, to the Lord and to his word. I believe it's a rare grace that if we see somebody sin, that we humbly ask to speak to them and to confront them. We need each other because we cannot see our own sins clearly. And if we really believe that lukewarmness is a potential trap for our souls, we should begin by praying for the grace to receive an admonition humbly and thankfully, and for the grace to administer one with great humility and care and love, but to do so obediently. I have found few tasks in the public life of the church, the corporate life of the church, that is resisted more steadfastly than that commandment of admonishing one another. Here are the words of Paul in Romans. Bear with me a minute here as I get to it. Romans 15. Verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and, this is a follow-on, and concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. The word there in the Greek is netheto, from which we get our word invented by J. Adams of Nathetic Counseling, which means to counsel in love for the purpose of restoration in godliness. Second Timothy chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 13. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Retain the standard of sound words. Strive for the purity of the gospel. And 2 Peter chapter 3, another admonition that's similar. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second time I'm writing you, to which I am stirring you up 
stirring up your sincere hearts by way of reminder. What does the verb stir up mean? It means to provoke to something. You stir a recipe to blend the elements, to make it ready to be baked. And Paul uses that phrase on several occasions, to stir up. I'm stirring up your, you, Timothy. I'm provoking you in a loving manner to greater holiness. And Jesus Christ is here in our text, inviting us to interact with each other. Back to the text again. Notice what he says here, following the commandment to be zealous and repent, to, re to repent with some fervency. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my word and reopens the door, I will con come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Now, I suggested earlier that this is not primarily an evangelical text, but a restorative text. And if context means anything, remember he's talking to the church. So he's talking to people whose hearts have become closed to abiding with Christ and fellowshipping with him. That's what the text is talking about. And you and I have the horrible capacity through such incremental, subtle means as just indifference lived out day by day, as well as the other ways I've mentioned, to end up in a condition where we're really not fellowshipping with Christ at all. And so Jesus Christ, in this text in particular, in Re Revelation, is knocking at the door, if you will, of each of our heart's affections. To come in, to dine with him, and to be with him, to abide with him. See how beautifully that ties in with the text that we considered this morning in John 15. And then it closes up the passage with what I suggested earlier. It's a call to the, use the means of grace. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The means of grace, the proclamation of the word, the reading of the word, prayer, the right use of the sacraments, pastoral care, loving interaction, and the fellowship of believers. These are means that God has designed for our protection and our recovery. I'd like to close by asking you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1. Beginning with verse 4. No, I'm going to begin with verse 2. Even though it's a bit long. Grace to you and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. We've considered this morning a number of his precious and magnificent promises, and not the least of which this evening in his promise to come in and fellowship with us and dine with us and him with it, and us with him. By which he's granted to us the knowledge of his great and precious promises. For by these, that is his great and precious promises, in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the word, world by lust. Now for this reason also, here he's saying you've escaped the corruption of the world, you've received great, magnificent, precious promises. His divine power has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness. What are we to do with it? Here comes the application. Verse 5, now for this reason, what's gone before in verses 2 through 4, 
Applying all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. That describes the saints in Laodicea. Having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about your, his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, stirring them up again, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. And I consider it right and long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. One of the things that you learn when you get older is your physical strength declines. Your ability to exercise and move things and lift things declines. Even when you have a regimen of some kind of good exercise. When I was younger, I used to love running. Now I can't run 10 steps following the collision I was in in 2009. And keeping up a measure of physical strength is a struggle. It'd be so easy to lie back in the, the recliner and just vegetate. And that's the kiss of death on growing in the grace of Christ. And our spiritual life is like our physical life. If we're not exercising, we do decline. We get weaker and more frail in our ability to do what we need to do. Christ has called us to be spiritually athletic, if you will, in the matter of our relationship with him, lest we slip into lukewarmness without even realizing that peril. If you think that you have slipped into lukewarmness, remember Christ promises overcoming is indeed possible. If you think you haven't, I encourage you to pray periodically that God will show you in the event that you have unwittingly begun to step into lukewarmness. May God give us the grace to be on fire for Jesus Christ. Amen. Father in heaven.